I'd like to welcome you to Michael Wood's third and final presentation today as part of the Caribbean semester. Michael earned his undergraduate degrees in finance and history as well as a master's degree in history, all from the University of Alabama, and then he went to Texas Christian University, TCU, for his PhD studies. Fate brought him back to the University of Alabama where he now teaches sports studies courses as an instructor in the Department of American Studies. His research deals primarily with international cultural encounters between the United States and Latin America. Currently his work focuses on American football games played between teams from the U.S. South and Havana during the first half of the 20th century. And he is hoping to turn that research into a book. He has been to Cuba four times, including once as an undergraduate student, conducting research every time. Uh, you can see that his final talk today is on U.S. and Cuba relations. So once again, Michael, we welcome you to Missouri Southern. All right. For the third time, thank you, Chad. Um, again, I want to I want to thank Brian for um, his help with the the arrangements, making. Uh, Doing the logistics portion. Logistics usually get, get overlooked, and logistics are what wins, wins and loses wars, so he needs to be uh, um, recognized as well. And again, uh, it's, it's, a, it's my pleasure to be able to, to talk with you here uh, at, at Missouri Southern for the third time, second time in a row, second period in a row. Uh, thank you for attending, those, those who are here in person, and I, I want to thank people on Zoom as well uh, for showing up. I'll be more than happy to, I won't guarantee I can answer, but I will entertain your questions at the end. How about that? All right, so the, the topic of this talk, kind of the, the organizing idea behind this talk. All right, well, I want to look at U.S.-Cuban relations, and I framed it as close and complicated. Uh, if, if you've read the, the program, uh, I, I quoted Lewis Perez Jr. Uh, in, in one of his books, and I, the, the quote comes from the introduction of the book, and it's always a little bit dicey uh, to quote introductions because it kind of calls into question, did, did you get any further in the book uh, with this? Uh, but in one of his opening statements in this book, uh, he, he describes U.S.-Cuba relations as being close and complicated. And I thought that was a good summary of U.S.-Cuban relations over time. Uh, and I'm going to try to, to center in on these ideas as close and complicated as we go along today uh, in, in this, this period. All right, so I ripped... A, a map from the internet, uh, just, just in case you don't know or are not familiar. Uh, the United States, Mexico, Canada, you know, the Western Hemisphere, uh, the U.S. Cuba is, lo is located, is an island, the long, largest island in the Caribbean, located approximately 90 miles south of Key West. Close proximity to the United States. Uh, from the 19th century going into the 20th century, uh, really 19th century, early 20th century as well. The United States, when the United States becomes an independent country, really as it's, it's spreading westward, there's also the concern of the south, of the waterways around the Gulf of Mexico, waterway, waterways around the Atlantic Ocean, and the Caribbean. Uh, so if, if you look at the geography, the just geographic location of Cuba, it's at the center of those three lanes. And it's, it's important, especially as the United States grows westward, uh, because trade coming out of the Mississippi River, you know, down through New Orleans and, and out to the Atlantic Ocean, has to cross Cuba. So there's a strategic portion to this. If, if a foreign power 
were to take an adversarial foreign power, were to take Cuba, in effect, they could cut off trade from the West or trade going to the West, uh, to the Mississippi River. So there's this strategic importance to Cuba, uh, to the United States. And as I mentioned, over time, there are efforts to acquire the, the, the island of Cuba from Spain. Uh, I should, should have probably started with this. Uh, from the, the 16th century through the, the end of the 19th century, Spain was a co uh, Cuba was a, a colony of Spain, colonial possession. Uh, Cuba, again, because of geography, was, was an important part of the early Spanish Empire because it, it sat at a point where uh, the, the wealth, the gold, and other precious metals that were coming from Mexico and coming from South America would come together and a combined fleet would sail to Spain. And the combined fleet would sail from Havana. And it's kind of a, a central point for those transatlantic movements of precious metals from the, United, from the, the Americas. Uh, so it was an, of strategic importance for the, the Spanish Empire as well. Now, I'm fast forwarding uh, in, in the 19th century, early 19th century, there's uh, independence movements, independence movements in Mexico, independence movements in South America. Simon Bolivar plays a, a major role in South America. Uh, but Cuba remains a Spanish colony through all of this. Uh, in fact, it's not until the, the late 1860s, 1868, that Cuba will, will begin to its process of uh, you know, armed resistance against the, the Spanish and move towards independence. Uh, the individual who starts the Ten Years' War, uh, 1868 to 1878, was Carlos Manuel de Cebedes. De Cebedes was a, um, a wealthy landowner. Uh, he, he owned basically a, a, you know, sugar plantations in the east of the island of Cuba, and in, in 1868, Cebedes freed his slaves and began an armed, armed movement against Spanish colonial rule in, in the East. Uh, and again, you know, there's, I'm fast, fasting forward through a lot of this, but he's, he's seen in Cuban history as uh, the father of the fatherland. The first armed resistance, the first individual who leads a, a resistance movement against the Spanish. Uh, so you have the beginnings of Cuba Libre, you know, moving towards a free Cuba, beginning in, in the 18, 1868 through 1878. What's the United States doing there, during this time? It's after the Civil War, Reconstruction in the South. There, the US, uh, the Grant Administration, uh, offers to purchase uh, the, you know, a couple of other administrations as well offered to purchase Cuba, basically take it off of Spain's hands. Spain refuses uh, because of the, the wealth coming, coming in from Spain from sugar during this time. All right, so the armed resistance, last 10 years, there's, there's some gains that are made, uh, some improvements in home rule and those sorts of things, but Cuba doesn't get independence during this, but it, it fosters an independence movement. Uh, and, and any talk about, about Cuba and, and you know, the, the independence movement would be incomplete without mentioning Jose Marti. Uh, because during the, during the Ten Years' War, uh, during the 1870s, really up until 1895, Jose Marti was in exile. He, he, he was, um, you could think of him as sort of an intellectual, a philosopher, uh, an essayist, Someone who's giving intellectual foundations, intellectual supports for Cuba being independent from Spain and leads this, this again, this movement towards Cuban independence. Uh, does so in exile up until 1895. 1895 is, is the restart of uh, armed resistance against Spain, a, a war that, that takes place from 95 through uh, 1898. And I, I included a, a monument here. It's, it's difficult to see because of shadows, but the, here's, a, here's a statue of Marti, and this is the Jose Marti Monument in, in, um, in Havana, in uh, Revolution Square. Uh, so it's, it's a major, it, it, just to give you an idea of, of the place Jose Marti occupies in, in this, the, 
Cuban idea of independence. He's, he's seen as the father of Cuban independence. Um, so he's, he's, a lot, he's a lot better at writing than he is at fighting because he, he in one of the early engagements, he's martyred uh, and again, dies for the cause of Cuba Libre and is celebrated in that way as well. All right, so I bring up all this because you know, the, the United States is sitting out the United States has interest in Cuba, um, late 19th century going into the 20th century. Uh, there's economic development in the United States uh, after the Civil War, you know, an increase in industrialization and production. Um, famously, 18, what, 1893, Frederick Jackson Turner's The End of the Frontier uh, arrives in the United States. And so the U.S. begins to look internationally for markets, and for expansion. We could really talk about this because you could, you could even put all of American history in, in terms of just expansion. Um, but uh, in the late 1890s, there's, there's a, a push for international expansion. And what's going on in the 1890s? An armed conflict in Cuba on the U.S.'s doorstep. Uh, and uh, there, there's traditional narratives of uh, the yellow press in the United States, fanning the flames of support for the Cuban cause, support for armed intervention into the, the Cuban cause. I have a couple of images here. The first image, top of the, top of the screen, uh, you have Cuba as, as a woman, a woman in distress, in a frying pan that, that's labeled Spanish misrule because I, I got yes, Spain was was harshly pushing putting down this this armed rebellion. Uh, they introduced what amounted to it's re reproduced in uh, Vietnam uh, strategic hamlets uh, of of um, you know basically quarantining uh, the the countryside and it, it causes starvation and and a lot of other uh, civilians died as as a result of those policies. Uh, so. There's some truth in this misrule, uh, but it's, it's definitely and quite literally fanning the flames of, of war. You know, there's the fire, and in the fire you see anarchy. It, the Cuba, you know, Spain has lost control of Cuba. Uh, the Cuban people are suffering. The U.S. needs to step in, and that's what you really see in the next image of Uncle Sam coming in to save the day. Uncle Sam shielding the damsel in distress, Cuba, from the Spanish. Uh, so you have this playing out in images in the popular imagination in the United States in the late 1890s going into 1898. All right, so the U.S. intervenes in Cuba. There's a negotiation that takes place. Uh, and in fact, U.S. Congress guarantees Cub the Cubans, the Cuban, you know, the, the Cuban Liberation Army, uh, that the U.S. is not going to annex Cuba after the war. It gives a guarantee uh, that we're, we're coming in as an ally. Uh, and uh, reluctantly, somewhat reluctantly, the, the Liberation Army provisional government signs a deal with the U.S. during this time turns into a much broader war than just in Cuba. Uh, the Spanish-American War, War of 1898, whatever you want to call it, uh, is a, a global war. Uh, the United States seizes uh, the, the Philippines during this time, which was a, a Spanish colony. Uh, and that's, that's a whole other topic uh, uh, that we, we, we don't have time to discuss. Um, the U.S. annexes uh, Puerto Rico during this time. The U.S. gains Guam in 1898. So there's, there's the spread of U.S. empire, overseas empire during, uh, as a result of this. And U.S. hegemony, overwhelming influence in Cuba. After, after the Spanish-American War, after the end of hostilities, uh, the, the United States occupies, has a military occupation of Cuba from 1899 through 1902. So we're, we're talking about 
a three to maybe four year period where after the war is over, the United States is mil has military occupation over Cuba. During this time, there's a handful of reforms uh, and, and other restructuring that, that takes place. Uh, it's, it's difficult to say that it's completely benign, but it's, it's definitely, so some of the improvements were, were positive, uh, like introducing modern sewer system in, in Havana and those sorts of things. But what, what the U.S. does during this time is, in effect, writes the, the Cuban Constitution. Uh, the Constitution that restructures the Cuban government on the U.S. model of uh, an executive branch, a legislative branch, a judicial branch, uh, of you know, set terms, four years for a president, and popular election, and those sorts of terms, and basically imprinting the U.S. model on Cuba. So if the U.S. can't, I know I'm, I'm kind of making some jumps here and some, some interpretation, but if the U.S. can't annex Cuba, they can model them after themselves and have that sort of you know, positive relationship, working relationship with Cuba. But the sticking point in 18, or 1902 was the passage of the Platt Amendment. This was, this, this Platt Amendment, in effect, gave the United States de facto sovereignty over Cuba. The U.S. could veto foreign, uh, foreign arrangements, foreign agreements that Cuba makes with other governments. Uh, the United States could uh, intervene militarily in Cuba uh, if U.S. citizens or property are, are threatened. The United States sets up the, the Guantanamo Bay naval base as part of the Platt Amendment, it has a, a long-term lease that the U.S. still, uh, that the Cuban government doesn't recognize, but the U.S. still upholds uh, with that. But bottom line with the Platt Amendment, it was a sticking point that the Cubans, the Cuban government held their nose and signed because even if it was limited sovereignty, it, would been, it was sovereignty. It was kind of regaining some agency in this, this relationship. So, let's see what I have here. It ushers in the time of, of the, Cuban, uh, the, the Cuban Republic. And again, this, you, you can look at the Cuban Republic as uh, having limited sovereignty, having overwhelming U.S. influence in Cuba, uh, influence in terms of uh, who, who financed the rebuilding after after nearly 30 years of war. It was Wall Street. Uh, it, was, it was U.S. banks flooding. So there's a lot of debt obligations in Cuba for U.S. debt. A lot of U.S. corporations enter into Cuba during this time and uh, purchase land uh, and, and build. And again, you know, this, this is a, a kind of double-edged sword here. Or they're, they're not, That's not a good, good term. How about two sides? Two sides of a coin. That works better. Uh, one side, the U.S. hegemony, oh, you know, influence over Cuba. The other side of that coin, Cuba was basically pushed the fast forward button on modernization and economic development. The U.S. also basically granted Cuba a, a, a favored nations agreement set up in, in 1902 as, as part of that agreement was uh, a sugar quota that the United States guaranteed that they were going to buy a certain amount of, cu of Cuban sugar per year and do so at a above market price. Uh, so it, it fuels, in the early republic, economic growth. U.S. influence also creates some divisions. Uh, part of Part of the idea of Cuba Libre, you know, dating back to, to Jose Marti, was uh, racial, you know, racial just, justice, racial equality, uh, of equal opportunity for uh, not just those of European descent in Cuba, but those of, of mixed heritage and also black Cubans, of, of kind of going beyond this. Marti says this explicitly in a lot of his writings, that one of the ills in the United States that he, he observed while he was there was race relations. And so this Cuban Republic would, would do away with that. 
That's the idea. What complicates things is U.S. involvement in Cuba during this period. The Cuban government doesn't officially, doesn't officially adopt, say, Jim Crow segregation type laws. But those sorts of arrangements, those sorts of relationships develop during this time. There's limited opportunity for black Cubans. And in fact, it's analogous to what, what we see in the South, in the U.S. South post-Civil War. Uh, to the point to where in, in 1912, uh, there was uh, the, the Independent Party of Color develops in Cuba. And a lot of, those, a lot of the members of the Independent Party of Color were veterans of the, the War of Independence. Uh, and you know, we're, we're saying, okay, the Cuban government is not, uh, is not upholding the goals of, of the revolution, of this, this, you know, of independence. Let's not say revolution, because we're gonna get there in a second. Um, that, that, you know, the, there's no racial equality. And assisted by the United States, under the Platt Amendment, the US, or the, the Cuban military violently suppresses this, this, the protests and um, what was amounting to an insurgency of uh, the Independent Party of Color. And thousands of black Cubans died uh, in that incident. So that kind of gives you an idea of how race relations were shaped during this period. There was racial exclusion, especially at, at, you know, at uh, the, the top of uh, the social structure. There were limited opportunities for black Cubans. And then uh, those of mixed race, it, it falls into the, uh, the politics of whiteness. If you can pass as white, there's more opportunities. If not, uh, there are less opportunities. So again, you know, this, this two sides of the coin, coin this, this complicated situation of, all right, during, during the Cuban Republic, Havana builds the, the, the Malacón, the you know, major, major works. Uh, the, this, you can't really see it, but the Malacón's right here. The, the famous seawall. Uh, there's, there's an influx of U.S. capital that builds hotels and restaurants, and an, especially in the 1920s, an increase in the tourism business. Uh, so there's, there's some economic prosperity going on, but it's limited during this time. And uh, something that I, I probably should have brought up a little bit earlier, but the Platt Amendment, that compromise, sowed the seeds of divisions within Cuba over uh, kind of political divisions. Those who are kind of on, on, especially at that time, on the conservative side who sided with the government and compromised with the United States, and those who were at the time considered liberal who, who were more nationalist. Basically saying that full, full independence, full Cuba Libre has not been achieved. It's been sidelined by the United States. And we've re-entered into a neo-colonial relationship with the United States. Uh, so are we better than we were when we were a colonial possession of Spain? And it's, it's, a compli it's, it's really complicated to, to really you know, reckon with all of this at the same time because so much is changing. There's some benefits, there's some limitations to all of this. All right, so I, I have here the Cuban Republic. There, there are different periods of the Cuban Republic. Uh, you know, I've, if, you, if you noticed, uh, the first Cuban Republic was uh, 1902 to 1906 because it was a second U.S. intervention, uh, a se second U.S. occupation, and then the, uh, the second U.S. occupation ends in 1909. And there's, there's, there are various other U.S. interventions, but no more occupations after that. And um, I, I end on 33 because... The, the last, um, here, I, I'll just go to this. There was a political crisis that takes place, late, late 1920s going into the 1930s in Cuba. Um, Gerardo Machado was elected president, and Machado began to use some of the national security apparatus that developed uh, during the, the Cuban Republic era stuff like the Rural Guard and, and other kind of state police, Cuban state police um, 
kind of superstructure, he began to turn that against his political opponents and began to make anti-democratic moves. Uh, there was, he pushed for and got because he packed the, uh, the Congress with uh, you know, political allies of, of, of himself. He, he passed for and got a postponement of an election and an ex extension of his, his presidential term. And this was met with opposition, uh, kind of violent, in a lot of cases, violent opposition. So we have this, this Cuban president who's becoming increasingly author authoritarian, uh, kind of shifting it into a dictatorship. And then uh, there's, a, there's a coalition of uh, mostly left-leaning, uh, kind of the left-leaning middle class, uh, kind of left, definitely left-leaning students at the University of Havana uh, who formed the, the Cuban Car Communist Party during this time. There's, there's organized labor that, that you know, rebels against this as well. And it, it ends in 19, uh, 1933. I, I have the, the sergeant's revolt up here because it's important, but it's, it's a more collaborative, it's a much larger revolt than that. Uh, it, it, it's, it, the sergeant's revolt comes at, uh, in response to a general strike that takes place. Uh, and uh, you know, in response to violent suppression of a lot of the protests. So the sergeant's revolt, non-commissioned officers within the, the Cuban military come together and in effect have a mutiny. Uh, they mutiny the, the Cuban army and support opposition to Machado. Uh, they, if, if you want to know the, the whole story, it, it ends with a, a siege of the Hotel Nacional. Um, you know, the, their, their commanding officers basically hold up in the Hotel Nacional and they, there's some shelling but, but no, uh, no major damage uh, takes place. But they, their commanding officers uh, surrender and I point this out because Fulgencio Batista was a sergeant that participated in this revolt. And Batista rises in the ranks, basically eliminates his competitors uh, within, within this movement, and seizes control of the military. And he becomes the head of the military. He's Colonel Batista after this. And he's the head of the military and, and wields the most political power in Cuba beginning 1934 through 1940. He comes back in a, a little bit later, but um, more on that in a second. Uh, so 1930s, going to the 1940s, there's effectively a, a revolving door of Cuban presidents, some legitimately elected, some appointed, and all of the negotiation of who's president and who gets replaced goes through the United States. The United States is dealing directly with Batista. And Batista is forming a close relationship with, it's informal, but with the U.S. State Department. And you know, this is during the, the era of uh, the good neighbor policy um, that, that really begins under Hoover, but is, it becomes standard under, uh, under Roosevelt. This is during the Great Depression, so there's, there's other priorities in the U.S. It's basically the U.S. saying, okay, you can control things, you can, you can stop the protests, bring some stability to Cuba. You can protect U.S. investments in Cuba. We will side with you. And you can pick whoever you, whoever you can work with in, in Cuba. So there's, there's a period. I, I think of it as kind of an interim period, uh, mid-30s going to 1940, where Batista's the power behind the scenes. And it's, it's effectively a military dictatorship, but... They, they uphold the, the facade of a democracy or a return to a democracy. Now, I, I ended, I brought up 1940 because there's a, there's a new constitution that's adopted in 1940. Uh, the 1940 constitution, in effect, undoes what Machado did during the late 20s and 1930s, uh, reorganizes, uh, the, you know, gets back to the 1902 Constitution in terms of the organization of the state, put some, put some guardrails in to prevent someone else from doing some of what Machado did. Um, also codifies or officially abrogates the, the Platt Amendment. Some of that happens in 1934, but 
puts it into the Constitution in 1940. Pretty much all of the, the conditions of the Platt Amendment go by the wayside except Guantanamo Bay, uh, the naval base. Uh, so in effect, Cuba gains full independence. There's still a lot of US influence, but all the restrictions of the Platt Amendment are gone in 1940. Uh, also, Fulgencio Batista is elected president uh, in 1940. And you might, you might look at this and say, okay, that's, that's funny business. This, this guy who is in charge of the military winning the first presidential election after this, the first kind of full presidential election after the passage of that constitution. But he did that with kind of a, a populist coalition. Uh, he, he, formed, he was a populist candidate in 1940 uh, and appealed to you know, the, the labor unions, the workers, appealed, appealed to the reformed Communist Party during this time. And so he, he gained popular support because, in effect, he was bringing stability. And he ran on you know, that, that Cuba is now free. I've restored democracy. That's, that's part of his appeal. Uh, after, after his term... Uh, in 40 to 44, in effect, Batista retires for a little while. He steps away. Still has connections, but he steps away. And there's a couple of more presidential elections. They're contested. You know, they're they're highly contested. Not, not necessarily in terms of the legitimacy of them, but you know, it, it's competitive races. And there was some violence, some kind of lingering political violence that was brought over from. Uh, the 30s. Uh, it was kind of a continuation during this time. But uh, in 1952, Batista comes back. 1952, he comes back to Cuba, runs for president, doesn't look like he's going to win this time, uh, uses his, his connections with the, the Cuban army and armed forces, and seizes control. Uh, he seizes power and affects calls into question the legitimacy of the voting, the legitimacy of the election, uses his connections with the, the, the army, and installs himself as dic what, what amounted to a, a military dictator of Cuba. He suspends the Constitution, sus suspends elections, and from 52 through 1959, rules Cuba. Is, is the strongest force in, in, uh, Havana, or in, in Cuba, and you know, his, his rise to power coincides with or, or inspires the Cuban Revolution uh, because people like Fidel Castro. Castro, he's coming of age during the 1940s. Uh, he's in, at, in, at the University of Havana in the 1940s, goes to law school, enters into politics, and is, is kind of idealistic and optimistic about the, the future of Cuba. And then 52, Batista comes back, there's a loss of democracy. That whole system, the, the optimism around that system collapses. And there's an armed resistance against that. And um, you know, beginning that, the next year, July 22nd, uh, 1953, there's an attack on uh, uh, barracks in the east, the, the, the Moncada base attack that was a, a complete failure um, on the part of, of the revolutionaries. Um, but served as the, the first shots fired in the Cuban Revolution. Um, Fidel Castro participated in this. Uh, Castro was arrested uh, and tried and sent to prison for this. Um, his, his, you know, this that kind of goes into the, the trial of Fidel Castro and you know, how, when he said, you know, history will absolve, absolve me uh, as part of his defense uh, in, in participating in armed resistance of uh, Batista because that, that movement, the original Cuban revolutionary movement, was a movement against a dictatorship. Uh, it was a nationalist, uh, a nationalist political movement to overthrow uh, an undemocratic, illegitimate leader. Uh, so there's, there's you know, that, that portion of um, you know, the, the underlying philosophy or the underlying reasons for uh, the, the Cuban Revolution, and uh, it's 53 through 1960 or 1956. Uh, there's there's a period after Fidel is, is released from prison. Uh, Batista, in, in an act of you know, being altruistic, uh, you know, basically gives gives you know a, a political you know, grants a, a, an amnesty for political opponents 
he's showing he's magnanimous, that sort of thing. But uh, Castro was part of this, and he, he goes to Mexico, and they, they begin to organize the armed portion of, of the Cuban Revolution. And, in, and that begins in 56. Now, there's, there's the, the guerrillas, the guerrilla fighters in, in the east, the eastern mountains, and uh, the Cuban Revolution becomes a, a much larger coalition. Uh, the, uh, the Cuban students in Havana, University of Havana students participate in this. Uh, 1957, a group of, of uh, kind of the, the most, uh, well, uh, the, the most active, I guess, of, of the, the student revolutionaries attack Batista's presidential palace, try to assassinate him, try to, try to assassinate the entire government, basically. Uh, and it's that sort of armed resistance and is, is multifaceted uh, kind of all over the, the, uh, the, the island uh, that, that was going on during the 19, 1950s going to uh, 1959. 1958, Late in the year 1958, there was, there was a major battle, and I want to just bring that up. Uh, the Battle of Santa Clara was the deciding moment. Uh, and that, that was a, 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 one of the few pitched battles in the, the Cuban Revolution. And in effect, the, the Battle of Santa Clara divided the island in two and uh, completely demoralized the Cuban you know, Batista's army. Uh, to the point to where you start to have mutinies within those ranks. And you know, by, by the end of 1958, you know, December 1958, going into 1959, uh, Batista resigns and leaves. And so you have the victory of the revolution during this time, uh, 59, going into, uh, into the 1960s. And a as I mentioned before, Cuban Revolution was not necessarily a communist revolution to begin with. There were some communist allies, uh, some 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 of of uh, you know the, those who uh, were on the far left were were a part of the overall coalition. But this was more of, as I mentioned before, a, a nationalist revolution against an illegitimate leader, uh, against a dictator. Uh, they promised a return to the 1940 Constitution. Uh, a promise to free and fair elections again. That gets complicated. 1959. Uh, they, 1959 when... I, I, I know this, this might cheapen their victory a little bit, but uh, I liken it to you know, when a dog chases a car, what happens when they catch it? Uh, they're, they're revolutionaries, they're ideali idealistic, they're romantics. They're not administrators. Uh, they're, they're not bureaucrats. Uh, so there's a lot of missteps early on in 59 and 1960. Uh, there's, there's good intentions. You know, there's, there's intentions for education programs and health programs and uh, you know, land reforms and those sorts of, of things that would benefit the majority of the Cuban people. But they don't really, they don't have any experience with the treasury. Che Guevara is, is the, <laughs> the, the, the minister of finance early on. And Guevara was a trained physician, a doctor. And beyond that, he didn't have any experience managing a, a company, much less a country. So there's those sorts of, of things that, that go on early on. And there's a, a slow move. <sighs> Uh, you know, the reaction of the United States, the, re the reaction of the international community to what's going on in Cuba. Under the, the umbrella of the Cold War that lead to a, a push or a drift of this revolution going to socialism or going to fully you know, declaring socialism and fully going into uh, alliances with the Soviet Union versus the United States. Now, some of the things that happened uh, in 1959 and 1960, there were trials uh, and executions that took place of Batista's commanders, of Batista's police, uh, and other collaborators. So, in effect, there were show trials that took place, and from the U.S. perspective, didn't look good. This doesn't look good. Uh, 
should we support this? And M59 was like, okay, this, this is just some of the, some of the pains, you know, the, the birthing pains of independence taking place. Uh, so maybe we shouldn't judge too much. But in 1960, when, when that government begins to seize companies and seize U.S. assets, that's when the United States really begins to react. Uh, they negate the sugar quota, which robs, well, that, that's a harsh word, uh, that, that takes away uh, a major revenue source for the Cuban government uh, and, in effect, puts their finances on, on um, shaky ground. And again, Castro and their government begins to, uh, they begin to look for other allies, other trade partners, and the Soviet Union comes in. Soviet Union and the, the Eastern Bloc co countries come in. They will buy your, that sugar. Uh, they'll buy it at a premium. Uh, and so there's, there's those sorts of ties that drift into that sphere that takes place. I'd be remiss if I didn't say, didn't bring up this. Well, it happens before this, but uh, the Bay of Pigs in 1961, major event. Uh, an event sponsored, trained. The U.S. gave the go-ahead uh, for an, an armed invasion of Cuba that was repulsed. Uh, I like to think of it as, in, 19, in April 1961, it was a, a D-Day style landing, but the, the Cuban government, Cuban authorities knew where, where it was going to take place. So imagine, imagine if D-Day took place and there were only a couple of thousand troops and the Germans knew exactly where they were going to land. And it, it didn't succeed. Uh, and it turned into a major embarrassment to the United States and a point of, okay, consolidating power for, for the Castro government. And by the end of that year, 1961, uh, in a, a pretty famous speech, Castro officially says the Cuban Revolution is a socialist revolution uh, and officially cuts ties with the United States. That they're going to be in op opposition of the United States. That they're siding with the Soviet Union and the Eastern, Eastern Bloc countries in the, the kind of global negotiation. In 62, Soviet Union begins to construct and send nuclear missile, n missiles to Cuba. This is pretty close. We almost had a, a nuclear war uh, because of this. Uh, and again, this, this for, further, further divides U.S.-Cuban US relations. There's, there's a firm dropping of, of diplomatic recognition, dip, diplomatic ties. U.S. institutes the, the embargo on Cuba as a result of this. Beforehand, it was an embargo. Now, uh, a complete ban of trade with Cuba and travel to Cuba. And in effect, from, from this point to, 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 the, to the present, really, uh, there, is, there is one time, did I turn it off? Uh, there is one time, very, fairly recently when uh, there was a, a relaxation of ties. Uh, the Obama administration in, in 2015 reestablished official diplomatic ties with Cuba, reopened the U.S. Embassy in Havana, had the full range of, um, full range of services available at that embassy. Uh, if, if you're here for an earlier, uh, earlier talk, Obama was the first U.S. president uh, from the 1960s to the present to, to visit Cuba, attends a baseball game while he's there. Uh, and so there, there was this, this point of promise that takes place only four years ago, really. But election of, of 2016 and the Trump administration's policy has been a reverse of the, the Obama administration policy, a return to Cold War standing and probably the worst and most divisive parts of that of that relationship, most restrictive by far. All right, so I've gone on, I've gone 50 minutes. Good grief! Uh, do y'all have questions? I don't know if we need to wait for the microphone or not, but. Texas, where they were with some of the 
So annexation of Cuba. Okay, so that's a good question. Uh, sort of. Uh, part of the, the Cuba Libre movement, those, those who were in favor of U.S. intervention in Cuba were a lot of the people who were at the top of society and they were in favor of annexation. And so they viewed it as, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll live under this, this Cuba, you know, this Cuban Republic for a few years, but we're moving towards annexation. But really after 1909, you know, that, that second version of this, the second ramping up of the, the, the Cuban Republic, uh, and uh, all of the economic advances and those sorts of things with, with the Cuban Republic, uh, there was a, a drift away from annexation. It was like, this, this relationship's working out, so let's not change it. So there was, there was a moment, and from the U.S. perspective, some were for annexation, some were against. Um, but really, by the 19-teens, going into the 1920s, any, any kind of an annexation ideas were dropped. Um, and it was just the, the relationship set. And the U.S. has, the U.S. had a pretty good position in that relationship. You know, they, they, they reap the benefits with not necessarily having all the responsibilities of having them as a state. Any other questions? So since their government was modeled after the United States government, when they started filling the Congress and whatnot with their own people to change things, did that concern the U.S. any and any issues with their own government? Yes. Uh, well, one consistency with U.S. policy, really from the 19th century through the Cuban Revolution, was the U.S especially after, after Cuban independence, 1902, the U.S. wanted continuity. They didn't want to change the policy, so some of the, the more nationalist politicians in Cuba, some of the, those who were pushing for you know, greater independence, less U.S. influence, the, the United States were, were against them and tended to side with those who were more, more collaborative. And so, uh, as, long as, as long as Machado had a cozy relationship with the United States, the U.S. wasn't going to get involved. It's like, if you want to be a dictator, be a dictator. Just don't, don't change the terms of our agreements. Uh, so that, that kind of gives you an idea of, of how kind of morally malleable foreign relations were. I mean, it's not necessarily principled, necessarily. Uh, it's, it's, you're, you're looking for your, your country's best interests and not necessarily regarding your, 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 um, the other country's best interests. Uh, it's, it's the same with, with negotiations and deals and that sort of thing. It kind of gets into the kind of realpolitik of foreign relations. And it, it's a common, common thread in U.S. foreign policy, especially during the Cold War, too, of supporting right-wing dictatorships who were anti-democratic and, in a lot of cases, um, you know, brutally, violently suppressed opposition. Um, but they weren't communists, you know, so we can deal with them. Any further questions? We're about out of time, but we could take one more. I'm sorry I monopolized the time. And I think uh, in March 2016, that's also when the Rolling Stones played their concert in Havana. Yeah, there, there were several. I mean, I think um, Jay-Z and Beyonce took a trip to Havana mm -hmm. about this time. High-profile U.S. and just kind of international stars began to... Uh, Rolling Stones, even though, I don't know, I don't know they're... I mean, they're, they're English, I know that, but I, I don't know if they're U.S. citizens or... Yeah. What, what that deal is, um, but there's, there's definitely was an uptick in awareness around and travel to Cuba yeah. during that time. Yeah, Cuba was really opening up in 2016, 2017, and now it's, of course, reversed again. Yeah, and it's, it's reversed on our side. Uh, they, they need the money. They, they need the tourism industry. And you got to assume after COVID-19, because uh, they, they basically cut off all travel into the, 
onto the island and ended the tourism industry since March or April of this year, that they're going to be hurting for dollars, hurting for hard currency. And so they're more than willing to have U.S. tourism uh, and contact. But again, you know, for political reasons, the United States has re reversed policy in a, a real stark way. All right, that's a good question too. All right, so one of the pillars of, of the Cuban Revolution was racial equality. That you know the the dream of Jose Marti was going to be realized, and so there's there's a dropping of racial exclusion uh, during the the revolutionary period, revolutionary governments period up until today. Uh, there's an end of social like exclusive clubs and, and you know, basically social classes, uh, kind of a leveling of Cuban society overall. So there's, there's those sorts of top-down approaches that, that change Cuban society and, and change some people's lives for the better, open up more opportunities and it makes it a little bit more equal. But some of the rhetoric around Cuba as a, a, a racial utopia. Everybody's, everybody has equal access and there's, there's no racial problems in Cuba. Is that, it's, it's kind of a myth. Uh, it's, it's more of a goal than what it is because there, there are still some systemic problems in Cuba that, that limit access to higher education and access to, um, I, I guess, party leadership and that sort of of um, those, those sorts of paths that would give power to black Cubans. So overwhelmingly, black Cubans are in, in kind of lower income um, still. So there's those sorts of disparities, but uh, there's, there, there's, I guess you could say there's progress, but it's limited. Was that, was that our fault? Or was it something before our fault? I, I don't think it's our fault necessarily. Uh, it's more of just the way, well, that's a really good question. I'd have to think about it. Uh, so I, I'm not sure how to answer that. Uh, it's, 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 it's asking the same question of, of race relations in the U.S. That yes, there's, there were constant or, or conscious decisions that were made that created inequality and maintain inequality and kind of made it systemic. Uh, and there's been efforts to unroll that, uh, to eliminate that and to correct that. But I'm not really sure you can assign responsibility in the case of Cuba. It was, it was kind of just working with the United States. They adopted some of the United States overall social divisions during that time and so I mean it wasn't like a top-down you know institute Jim Crow segregation type, type deal it was more of okay this is what's going on in the US we're going to do it in Cuba too or that's how it developed it might not have even been conscious thank you, thank you.